Welcome everyone to Sustainable Packaging Podcast with Corey Connors. I would like to welcome Mr. Kurt Bisola to, to the podcast today. He is an incredibly talented and successful packaging designer and overall designer. And I, I think that this his perspective is going to be very unique and very important in the chain of sustainability that we're trying to build on this podcast. So welcome, Kurt. How are you, sir? Hey, thanks, Corey. I'm doing well, man. How about you? I can't nope. complain yet. It's still <laughs> relatively early. I had my coffee, getting ready to watch some UEFA Champions League when we get off, off this call. So I'm doing well, man. Doing Wonderful. well. Yeah. Wonderful. What is that league? I'm, I'm not familiar. Oh, okay. So UEFA Champions League, it's for soccer, oh. football, as they call it. And it's for like a European <laughs> league for all the all the championship leagues. Like you have La Liga, which is Spanish, and you have Serie A, which is Italian, and you have Ligue 1, which is French. And then you have the Premier League, of course, in England. And then you have the Turkish League, you have the Russian League. And all these teams come together and they play in two leagues. And this is very packaging related, by the way. So yeah. I'm glad we're going into this. It's important. Um, <laughs> one, one is from the Europa League, which is a bunch of teams that didn't quite qualify for the Champions League. And the Champions League is all the teams from those leagues I mentioned, like the top four, or top six, top two. And they go to this league and play for the, the, the bragging rights, basically, of being the best club in the world and so today the semi-final between PSG and Man City. PSG is Paris Saint-Germain which is in Ligue 1 and then Man City of course is in English Premier League and they're ranked number one right now in the Premier League so yeah I'm just love soccer played my whole life. Oh, I haven't played awesome. in a while but yeah so sorry tangent. tangent I love over. that. I love that. Kind of, <laughs> it's important that we get to know you as a person. Some people would say that. Most... <laughs> well awesome. I'm very impressed with your your Titles, you're the creative director and founder of Mind the Font. And yeah. I see that you've done that for about two years. Right. According to your LinkedIn profile. And you're also a podcast host and, and very active on Clubhouse, like myself. And I think that's where we originally met, if I recall. Clubhouse. Yeah, we did. Oh, yeah. I think so. Either that, it was it was from either Avelio or Adam. Yeah. And Avelio Matos or Adam Peak and... Mm -hmm. It was through somehow, some way, and like, oh, this guy's a packaging dude. I'm like, oh, cool. And <laughs> and yeah. And then of course the name Corey Gate, it's like, fuck, that's just brilliant. It's like, Had to go it. with it. <laughs> dude, it's it's so good. It's 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 one of those things that seems so obvious, you know, especially if you're a designer or if you're a problem solver. Like I always think of myself being a problem solver that just happens to do design. So yeah. when I see something like that, I'm thinking, fuck, dude he came up with that why didn't anybody else come up with it of course it has to be taken it's like no it's not it's like damn it's so good so good thank you so much i i i've gotten some actually some calls from people saying man i wish my name was Corey, so i could be Corey gated <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, see it doesn't work well with kirk gated or mark gated mark Gabe kirk gated. mark yeah. Kirk king yeah so tell us about uh your background a little bit what got you into design Wow. Well, first of all, let's go back to Kirk yeah. as a young kid. Yeah. Uh, Kirk as a young kid was really into comic books and drawing. And it was pretty funny because recently one of my elementary school friends who I'm still in touch with, she posted a picture that I did because her father was an incredible illustrator. And I saw a picture that I did and I'd done lettering. And you know, if I could find it, I'll send it to you. But it's uh, when I find it, I'll send it to you. Just remind me. But it's pretty cool because it shows I was already doing lettering and this is like in sixth grade, right? And I was doing it wow. before then too. Always been in the comics, but I never knew about graphic design, didn't know anything about it. I was actually pre-med and I was really? gonna go to, yeah, I was gonna go into medicine. I really admire and, and love science and math. And um, it was that or a firefighter, but pre-med was kind of, <laughs> okay, cool, I can do this. And my dad was a medic in the Air Force for a while. But then I, I got into it and realized that I wasn't a very good student. I just, I'm a fucking terrible student. Sorry, I hope I can cuss if I cuss. This is for sure. This is an adult show, yeah. Well, you should have someone else because adulting is not the best thing for me right now. <laughs> um, but no, so, so I was in school and I realized like I wasn't very good at studying and stuff like that. But I loved, I loved the idea of, of, of chemistry and science and stuff because you're always trying to solve a problem. So you're always thinking about how do you solve this problem? And I realized like more and more initially, I was a problem solver. Still didn't know about graphic design. And I got together with my ex-wife, who was my girlfriend at the time. She said, hey, 
why don't you come to classes with me at San Jose State? I'm taking some design classes. I'm like, all right, cool. So we go and she's going through classes and they're doing all these things with all these rules and all this spacing and lettering. And I'm thinking like, well, this is stupid. It's so subjective, <laughs> right? It's so subjective. I'm used to objectivity. Like if I know one plus one is always going to be two, you know, and one in design is like one plus one is two, but also 1.9 plus 0.1 is two and one and a half plus a half is two. So there's all these different ways to get to a solution. Well and, said. Yeah, and so it's like there's all these different manners of getting to a solution. I realized like, oh, okay. And I started getting into it, and and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. Well, come to find out, my ex-wife's father, my father outlaw, as he is now. <laughs> I like that. That's perfect. yeah, yeah. It, it, someone told it to me, and I just keep using it. He I... he ended up becoming my mentor in design because I started getting into it, and he was the head of the creative services department at Ian J. Gallo Winery for about forty years. Wow. And he designed the ENJ brandy bottle. Like I've I've seen the clay sculptures that he Jeez. made. Like he, it's it's fucking dope. And he's a global like icon from that realm of of like people in the industry for a while. Like you said his name, like Joe Vizola. It's like oh, I know who he is. And I had that as a mentor, dude. Like that was that was the craziest thing. And and that's kind of how I got into it. Recently, there was a survey taken. I think it's designsurvey.org or designcensus.org, where they they interviewed roughly 9,500 designers or 9,600 designers. And out of those 9,600, only 3% were black. So wow. uh, designer color, yeah. So it was pretty crazy that- I didn't I, know it was that low. Wow. It's, it's, it's insane, man. And the, the craziest part is not only did I get into the field, but I also found someone who was renowned in the field <laughs> that just happened to live in the town that I grew up in. It's it's all, it's just the fucking weirdest story. And I just happen to be good at it. And like it's meant to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's like one of those things where literally destiny or your your fate falls in your lap. Yep. And and I just fell in love with it. It's one of those things where I don't I don't take time off because I don't ever <laughs> feel like I'm I, you I love your job. Like I'm working. Yep. Yeah. I don't feel like working. But the, the other problem I'm having right now too is just it's just fatigue, like everything mm -hmm. going on in the world. And, and just stuff like that. It's really making me feel fatigued. And so yeah. I'm having problems to, to, to get going at times and try to be creative. And so I was thinking today, like, oh, so Corey, I can't do it today. I'm like, no, nah, man, like I, I have a podcast too. And, and when you have someone commit to you and they say, I can't do it, it's like, that's fucked up. So I'm like, I got to talk to Corey. It's going to make me feel better too, get my juices going. So this is it. So yeah, long well, story short, that's long story less long. That's how I got into <laughs> I, I truly, truly appreciate you making time, even, oh, even when you're going through stuff. Yeah. I, I truly respect you and your community for, for the struggles that you guys are going through and <laughs> all communities that all okay, communities yeah, that yeah. you're a part of. Yeah. Thanks. But man. we need to be uh, here together and, 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 and solve this, these issues together. And, and yeah, no, it's, and it's, it's just work to I be mean, done. I'm not, yeah. It's, it's not. I don't want to tangent off because this is a packaging podcast yeah. about sustainable packaging and yes, sir. sometimes design related things. But at the same time, I think whenever we can, we need to stick up for those who have been marginalized Yes, from one, one standpoint or another, whether it's handicapped, LGBT, black, Asian, native yes. American, or indigenous people. It's like, we have to hold others accountable and make sure that we're all looking towards moving in, a, in an equitable way to make the society better for everyone. Truly. Yes for everyone. And right. so I'll get off the soapbox now and then so yeah. So that's an, how I got into design. It's an important soapbox. So thank you, sir. So I'm asking everybody this, can packaging be sustainable? Absolutely not. Fuck no. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course it could be sustainable. Good. It, it yeah, Good. man, it, it to me it all goes into the care and processes in which you're making the packaging. Right. And also hey, here's here's a great story. Not a great story, but just kind of a way to, to, to anal, uh, use an analogy to, to describe it. Yep. If I'm ever designing something as far as the packaging goes, I have to think of all the ways in which it's going to be used, how it's going to flesh out to different SKUs, how it's going to flesh out to a different product. And I really have to think about its life after the initial design. How does it evolve and how does it continue to live on? Yes. I think it's the same thing with packaging. You have to think of something outside of the initial packaging design, like what's going to happen to it 
after that person spends 30 seconds opening it, what's going to happen to it? Are they, are, if they want to keep it, fine. And I'm one of those weirdos that does keep packaging to kind of reuse it. I have <laughs> a box full of like gift cards and cards and, and one of my old um, iPhone boxes, right? So yeah. I'm one of the people that does on occasion keep packaging, but most of the time it's like, okay, it's cardboard, I'll just recycle it. Mm -hmm. Or So you have to think about that. So you have to really think about the life cycle of the packaging itself. And I truly, this is really, I don't know, naive or trusting of me, whatever, but I try to rely on my, on my, my printer mm -hmm. to really give me the insight I need that's necessary in order to make sure that everything's being done properly to be sustainable or as sustainable as possible. And most, most printers are now, a majority of them are now really thinking about that because it comes back on them too. Like, oh, right. you produced all of this and you didn't make it possible for it to be sustainable. It's kind of on you. Yes. I think there's two things also that may, since I'm droning on, and I thought about this, two things that I think really are, are helpful in regards to making sure that people understand the impact of packaging. I think that the person who's having it printed Let's, let's talk about like Nestle or Pepsi or Coke, large companies printing, printing millions of things. Right. And the I think huge that portion. they, yeah. correct. And I think that they need to be held responsible to make sure that their carbon input while printing and also after printing mm -hmm. is, is, is held accountable. And it's more than, to me, it needs to be like sufficiently heavy fines, like find them $2 billion for printing something wrong. Because, because if you find them like, oh, we're going to find you a million dollars, oh, whatever, it's chump change. Right. You know, but if you really hit them, and it sucks, if you hit people in the pocketbook, they usually exact change. Mm -hmm. um, hey, I like that. Pocketbook change, kind of like a little play on words. But yeah, so that's one way you could think about doing it. And, and the other way too is, is to offer better recycling yes. in all areas for people to be actually be able to use their things. Like if I see recycling and on the back of it, there's a different number in, in the circle of life, you know, yes. the, odd the chasing arrows, arrows. Yes. Yeah. Chasing arrows. And if I look at that, I'm like, okay, cool. I can throw it in there. And then my wife comes, she's like, you can't put this in there. I said, why it's recyclable. Well, they don't take that here. Or they don't take it this way. So right. I'm like, what, why would you even put that on there? And why would you even offer recycling if you don't, recycle it properly or you don't offer the means for people to recycle it properly properly. So I think that also needs to be handled in much, a much more universally communal communal impact. I think that's yes. where it needs to happen is in the community and whoever's running the trans the the disposal units or uh, I'm trying to think of the proper word. The MRFs, the material recycling facilities. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So they need to be able to to make things more readily accessible for for people like myself, consumers like myself, and yep. we're interested in it. So I think companies need to be more responsible and recycling needs to be more readily and easily accessed. They say that 50 million households in the United States don't have access to recycling at all. That's 38% of us. And to me, that's a, a travesty. It's absolutely sad. It's so, fine, you know, we'll just, we'll just keep polluting the planet <laughs> and uh, we'll just go to Mars. I think that's great. It's yeah, it's fucking it, unbelievable. It's got to change, and I I want to. I think you and I can be a part of that change and and help continue to push this forward towards sustainability. So that's why I was so excited to talk to you. I love the designer perspective because you really, you you really have one of the first legs in the journey, and I agree with you that you, you we should rely on or we should get the help of production. I'm often asking, you know, is this paper FSC certified is, you know, things like that. So good, good point. I think it's important yeah. that we all have a, a stake in the game. Yes, absolutely. And like I said, it's when I'm sitting on the computer and I'm just making stuff yeah. and I sketch out my sketch and I move digitally and then I try to present an idea. Once it's at that point of being approved, I think, oh shit, now where do we go? <laughs> who do I talk to to get this and get this done and make sure it's done properly. And yeah. that's where I just kind of rely on sources that I've used before in order mm -hmm. to make sure that I'm doing the best I can to help environmentally and things like that. And then I'm going to go jump in my, in my Humvee and, uh, <laughs> but it's, yeah. it's not a Humvee now. It's like a Humvee from <laughs> 20 years ago. It just guzzled gas. So, yeah. yeah. Diesel. I there love you it. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I, and 
you know, that's another aspect, of course, of sustainability. You know, a lot of people are talking about uh, sustainable packaging, but then they're importing it from all the way around the other side of the world. And it's like, well, okay, I, that's good that you have sustainable packaging, but could you have purchased it locally? or near nearer to you and i think that's one aspect of things that that we're not thinking about sometimes when you're looking at packaging so dude it's i just got sent a sample from a vendor who works here from his manufacturer in china so he's a glorified middleman i mean i'm simplifying it and making it sound like this bad thing but it's like <laughs> and, and i want to go to the person i'm using like why can't we find someone local because when, when all said and done, if, if you, let's say you spend, you're going to spend 1500 bucks for, for, you know, three, 2000 units, I'm just throwing out numbers, sure. or you could spend 2000 for 2000 units, right? But you're right. not making the same impact. You're giving it back here to the community. I'm not saying that don't ever source things out, out of the country, but I'm thinking like, what impact does that have overall, if you're trying to think of being green and sustainable? Yeah. Like that, I mean, there's, there's just makes sense. I agree. We are a global economy and, and that's important to right. support everyone. But Correct. I think we're all, we're both saying the same thing. We should, yes. when, when possible, yes. uh, source near you. And that, that helps in a lot of ways, in, including costs, advantages, and sustainability. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Great point. Absolutely. So right. what do, What's what do you, question? what Boss. do you think is, yeah. What do you think is the, <laughs> the best way? to impact sustainability? Is it, is it design? Ooh, I, I think it's the entire process. I mean, I, I kind of touched on it before of thinking, yeah. thinking of the life cycle of the product, not just from, from using it, but from its conception and why it's being made and also how it's being made and then what to do after it's been used and getting thrown away or putting back into the system. I've also thought about different, different ways to, and it's, it seems kind of cliche and, and and kitschy, but when you have when you have something, and like I talk about I, the my iPhone box, like purposely make something so people can reuse it, so they can yeah. repurpose it for things. Try to think of it that way. Maybe you have, maybe you make a bottle that's square shaped, and then people can use it to to build walls or to use in different right. communities or you know just something silly like that. It's just off the top of my head, yeah. but maybe you could actually figure out a way to repurpose the packaging or think along the lines of how is that product going to be used throughout throughout its entire life cycle and life recycle so that's that's the one i was thinking but i'm not sure but i like that life recycle yeah. i haven't heard that that's brilliant there you go i just came yeah. up with it it's almost as good as corrugated but but not really i'm writing that down right now trademark it you heard it here <laughs> first oh you'll get the credit sir <laughs> uh, I, I don't fuck the credit. I want cash, man. <laughs> well, uh, and maybe a, a Bitcoin or two. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's the future. Well, thank you so much for 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 joining me today. I truly appreciate it. I guess the last question is, how do we get a hold of you and your and and your company? What's the oh, best? It's, it's funny. My company's name is Mind the Font, right. and MindTheFont.com. And then you can contact me that way, or just type in Kirk Visola. I'm the only Kirk Visola. So that's really good and bad at the same time. So if something's out there and it says Kirk Visola, it's probably attached to me one way or another. But I think if you type in Kirk Visola, my name pops up there in LinkedIn. You can contact me through LinkedIn. So yep. just remember the name and you'll find me. That's really nice. I, I don't know anybody else that has a, that unique of a name. That's cool. See, there you go. There's another Corey I, Connors. You know that's a professional that, golfer. <laughs> oh, well, you just say you're him from now on. No. Just say you're him. I think that works. I'm that unique of a person. So that's that's why it's I mean, I agree. bullshit. I mean, I mean <laughs> you I, are special. <laughs> my mom told me so. Um, <laughs> Speaking yeah. of your mom, I love your your interviews with your mom. Mondays with Marilyn. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. On Clubhouse. It's okay so i do podcasts also and the, the podcast i do is just kirk's podcast okay wow super original but no one had it because there's not that many kirks in general I don't, i've met like 12 kirks in my life so i'm saying fuck it i'm gonna call it kirk's podcast mm -hmm. and the idea of the podcast is just to interview people that i admire who've inspired me along the way so cool. the first one was my mom and my mom i asked her about her life where she grew up and then we kind of get into things 
and I'm recording it and I realize like, fuck, my dad passed away and I never really got a chance to ask him these questions or record these answers or record these questions. It's like this, with means of preserving an or oral history, like yeah. the history of things being told orally is diminishing through the use of text and podcast and not podcast, but text and, and everything else. Like we don't really yeah. record talking anymore. So as I came up with the idea, I'm like, shit, I should do this with my mom all the time. Cause people were like, oh, your mom's great. Love listening to your mom. She's hilarious. I listen to her all the time. I'm like, well, fuck, why not do it? And that way I can record what we're talking about. I get some stories from her that are just priceless. And yeah. then I get a lot of her sayings and phrases and just, just the way she grew up and how she taught us and just the way she raised us as well. And something that stuck with me, stuck with me for a while since we had that interview was she said, I raised you like a white liberal woman would raise a black child. And she meant that from a standpoint of being proud of who I was, knowing, knowing my worth, knowing my value. So I've always been raised with, with a, an immense sense of, of being okay, being in, being myself. Yep. And, and that's what it really taught me. So the whole idea behind Mondays with Marilyn is just to talk with her about current events or, and we just, we just go off tangents. We just go with called stream of consciousness, whatever you start talking <laughs> about, whatever you're talking about, keep talking about it. And, and I got text her question. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Corey. What? I love that. I, I listened to that episode and your mom is amazing. So I, I could see how that she's yeah. like that kind of motivation. I mean, you're lucky to have her as, as a, as a mom. I, I, dude, I, it's the stats for the stats for black males in this country are not very good for both parents being around in general and they're being involved in their kid's life. Like they're not very high. And I was, I was lucky enough to have both my parents at home. They both stayed married and they had a fairly normal marriage. I mean, you see him bicker on occasion, but my dad would, he would do anything for my mom. My mom would do anything for my dad. And they taught us a good sense of value, taught us good work ethic, taught us good morals. So it was nice to have that growing up. And, and for, for people, I, I got lucky. And there's no other way to fucking put it, man. It's lucky I'm alive. And that's, and that's a shitty thing. I haven't been in jail. <laughs> which is just kind of like, I mean, it, it sounds silly, yeah. but it's like, that's a stat for, for black people in this country. That's, that's staggering. It's like one in three or one in four black men are in jail at one point in their life. Yeah. And, and it's just, it's just staggering. I, I, I consider myself fortunate, lucky, blessed, whatever you want to say to, to be in the situation I'm in. And a lot of it is due to my upbringing and, and her, and she has a great sense right. of humor and and a strong sense of morals and ethics that were instilled in all my brothers from a young age. So yeah, I'm really fortunate to have that. So Mondays with Maryland, 12 o'clock PM on Clubhouse. Uh, Pacific, Pacific right. time on Clubhouse. And you need to have an iPhone in the app to listen. It's worth listening to. It's fun. Come on in and we'll chat. Yeah. And not only not in jail, but very successful. So you yeah, went, well, you went the other way. <laughs> yeah. Well Define success. Define well, success. <laughs> you, you love your job. You know, you're happy, I do, man. Yeah, and, I, am. And you, I am. I think that is so rare. I, I am uh, fortunate to be interacting with lots and lots of people and that have lots and lots of different kinds of jobs. And I have to say that uh, a large portion of them don't really love what they do. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's sad when there's so sad. many opportunities. When It is you know, sad. Yeah, it's, I mean, real quick, again, my one of my really good friends he is a cpa and every year during tax season his body literally shuts down he gets so stressed that parts of his body stop working and he says every year i hate my job i need to find something different to do and it scares me it like it makes me worry for him because he's 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 such a good dude super smart clever and just recently started painting and he's oh, cool. a really good painter yeah he's a, he's a good painter it's 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 one of those things where i feel like salieri you know, like in Mozart, Amadeus. If you yep. haven't seen the movie, look it up. But Salieri is Mozart's nemesis in the movie, right? And he just so he tries so hard to do all these things, and along comes this dude who just does it effortlessly. And it's like, why is he able to do that? And that's how I Man. feel about him painting. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like I look at his paintings, and and it's not necessarily the compos it's not necessarily the the realism of them, or like the proper look and style and feel if he's painting something. It's the fact he understands tones shading tonality shadows it's like what the fuck it's so upsetting and it's that's so not, upsetting for me that's not, not learned right no. that's like that's like a it, natural it, it, it's either like 
when you first start doing it, I have to say, if you're able to do it, it's natural. You can learn. I mean, that's why they right. teach classes. I'm not going to say, oh, you can't learn that. But for him just to sit down and never painting before and then knock some shit out, it's like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> how, how? Frustrating so, uh, for us, yeah. us mortals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think he'd rather, I think he'd rather be painting and doing that because he loves doing that. And so you're right. It's very fortunate to bring it back to your original statement that we are doing something that we love. Yeah. yeah. Well said, and what a great way to end the show. Thank you so much, Kirk. I, I truly appreciate you, and, yeah. and I'm excited to, to release this to the world. So. Oh, Corey, dude, thank you so much, man. I, I really appreciate you having me on the second guest. That's right. That's You're the, uh, number two, but, but dude, number one is, today. <laughs> yeah, man. Thanks. I appreciate it so much, and thank you for having me on. And always look for Corrugated That's right. on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. Appreciate Thank the you, shout out. Absolutely, right. man. Thank you. Thank you. See ya.